Production of Kansas City Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Should racism push Kansas City into renaming one of its most famous fountains? The Trump administration now trying to fix a homicide spike in Kansas City. Missouri eliminating funding for DUI checkpoints. What impact will it have here? Averting a school shutdown in Kansas and Major League Baseball stepping up to the plate for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and good to have you with us again on the program that connects the dots on the news of the week in this place we call home. Dissecting those headlines, the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske, and across town, behind another microphone, KMBZ's Scott Parks, Eric Wesson, the senior writer for The Call newspaper, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. Now, in case you missed it, the Trump administration has named Kansas City one of 12 crime-plagued cities to get targeted help and money from the Justice Department to help reduce an escalating homicide rate. We must act to reverse this new surge in violent crime. The funding announced by Attorney General Jeff Sessions this week comes as the Kansas City Police Department reports it's putting more officers in four targeted geographic areas that are bearing the brunt of violent crime. So far this year, there have been 67 homicides reported in Kansas City. That's a 40% increase on last year. Drive-by shootings are up 51%. Is the city able to dispatch, though, more officers to more crime-impacted areas because of the Trump administration? Or is this week's announcement of more officers just a coincidence, Eric? Just a coincidence, really. Uh, it looks good, it sounds good, it makes it seem like they're trying to do something with it. But more officers is not going to solve the problem because of the way the crime moved. And I think Forte did it with hot spots, having more officers in high crime areas. The next thing you know, you look at the paper and you, your crime has moved to another area. So you run officers over there, then they move to another area. The mentality is what has to be changed. And being a black male, having more police officers on the street just puts me more at risk of being stopped, whether I'm doing anything or not. I just have the likelihood of being stopped because I'm a black male. We have had two techniques that we've heard about, you know, the curfews in parks and trails we've heard mm -hmm. about in the last month. Now the targeting of police officers in certain areas. That's not enough, Dave Helling? Well, it isn't enough. It, it, it won't hurt, but it isn't enough, as Eric points out. There are other pathologies on the east side and in most urban areas that need to be addressed, the wide availability of weaponry, the uh, you know shoot first, ask questions later mentality, the, the, the you know argumentative nature of some confrontations. But it's, it's not a bad thing. I will say that the police department is now conducting or has conducted a, a manpower deployment survey that was actually supposed to come out in May. It hasn't come out yet. In the next couple of weeks, we'll get a good handle uh, on whether or not the department can put more officers on the street and have less money going for back office functions performed by civilians. That will be helpful as well this summer. Scott. I'll just I'll politely disagree with uh, Eric for sure. Um, I, I think the police department can't win for losing. If they put more officers on the street, they get criticized for and, and put them in certain neighborhoods that happen to be ridden with crime, they get criticized for that. If there aren't enough officers on the street, it seems to me the police department also gets criticized for that. Every year we hear this debate going on in Kansas City regarding the budget. Well, if we if we move money from here to here, think how many more police officers that police officers that would buy. Well, isn't that in in line with saying the more police we have on the streets, the less crime we might have? No, it's not. <clears throat> That just means that black males will have more contact with the police because those crimes are being committed in black neighborhoods. So putting more police there is not going to solve the problem. It just makes us more at risk. Steve. You know, we are a soundbite society, Nick, and we all want simple solutions to very complex problems like the soaring crime rate in Kansas City. Let me just point out the problem in Kansas City isn't relegated just to homicides. All uh, categories of violent crime are up, at least for the first three months of this year, compared to previous years. That's a big problem. But these, you know, these situations go into poverty and jobs and education and the, the plight of our public schools. You know, we, we need to address all these things at once to get a handle on what we're talking about here. At the same time this week, the Kansas City Police Department resurrects the issue of body cameras. 
The interim police chief reporting this week that while the department philosophically supports body-worn cameras and wants to implement them as soon as is feasible, it'll cost $6 million to do this properly. When you account, that is, for the camera's cost, but most significantly, the hefty price tag involved in monitoring and storing the thousands of hours of footage those cameras capture. That investment would come at a time when money is already tight, and Channel 41 reports there are now fewer officers on the street in Kansas City today than there were even three years ago. So does paying for these cameras come at the price of adding new officers on the street, Dave? Okay, let's have a little bit of a truth watch here. The Kansas City, Missouri Police Department spends a quarter of a billion dollars every year, $250 million, double what they're uh, supposed to get from the general fund, more than double. So there's plenty of money to do this if they wanted to. But the idea that it would cost $6 million is uh, really over the top. The storage cost of $3 million is over five years. That's 600000 a year. Uh, the cameras would be almost free. Some providers have said, hey, we'll just give you the cameras if you buy storage from us. And the idea that you need to add 22 people to uh, supervise and administer a body camera uh, program, that looks to me like the police department is looking for a reason not to do this program. Body cameras are very important and Kansas City should pursue it as much as possible. Scott, but should it come at the expense, even if it isn't the price tag that Dave Helling is suggesting, or as he's saying it doesn't have to be as expensive as that, that that means that some things wouldn't be done because you have to pay for it? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, they haven't identified exactly where this money is going to come from to begin with. But I'm with Dave. It, I thought that the price tag was enormously high. And this idea of adding all this extra staff, I mean, we record everything that we do at the radio station. And we do get requests for things that have actually gone over the air. Well, guess who handles it? I do, or somebody else, or Dana does. Yeah. We don't have a, a department at the radio station that handles all the requests that come in for things that have gone over the air. 22 people sounds to me a bit ridiculous. Eric. Yeah, it's, it's a bit ridiculous. And then when you look at Seattle, where people were asking for archive tapes, and they, they're, I think they're basing that off of what's been happening in the past, and they asked for archive tapes. They had to spend a lot of time and money finding those tapes so that people could do it because of the Freedom of Information Act, because it's public money. So it could be pretty expensive. Should racism push Kansas City into renaming one of its most famous fountains? In a column in your Kansas City Star this week, Steve Kraske says it's time the city confront its racist past and rename the J.C. Nichols Fountain, which stands on the east entrance of the plaza. Just as many southern cities are removing Confederate monuments, he says the past matters here, too. While acknowledging Nichols' role as a visionary who built the plaza, he says his legacy has been tarnished by racist actions as a developer, where he championed restrictive deeds, blocking blacks and Jews from living in the subdivisions he built, from Brookside to the most established subdivisions in Johnson. County, but why now, Steve? You summarize that very well, Nick. And well, I guess first off, it's always a good time to raise issues like this. Second, uh, based on a class I teach at UMKC, is I've learned more about J.C. Nichols' legacy. This began to bother me more and more. And then, as you mentioned, what's happening in the Deep South in this country right now is simply extraordinary. Uh, leaders down there rethinking the monuments to Civil War heroes, people who have been held in, in such high regard for, for generations, Jefferson Davis. And, and generals from the Civil War. So it's always a good time to bring these issues up. Is there a difference, though, between a Confederate leader and a, and a, a developer in Kansas City who some believe was, was more of a function of his time, had views that were a function of his time? I, I've known Steve Kraske for many years, and I respect <laughs> him, and I like him. Thanks, when Matt. I read that column this week, I was shocked. Uh, Steve says what's happening in the South is extraordinary. What's happening in the South is borderline ridiculous. We cannot simply use glasses from 2017 and apply them to the lifestyles and the lives of people that lived 100 years ago or 150 years ago. J.C. Nichols, I would bet most people in Kansas City don't even know the history of J.C. Nichols or that he forbid the sales of homes to Jews and blacks in his subdivisions. But I will say this, if we're going to, and I don't mean to pun here, if we're going to whitewash our history in Kansas City and in this country, there are a lot of names that we're going to have to start changing. Johnson County is named after the Reverend Thomas Johnson. He was a slave owner. Andrew Jackson was a slave owner. George Washington was a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Think of all the things that we would have to name just in this area because the people they're named after own slaves. 
I would argue that owning slaves is a form of racism. And it's much more, it's worse than saying you can't sell a house to a black person or to a Jewish person. Before I go back to Steve, Eric, if you were to look at racism in this community and the past of racism and, and you wanted to make a difference, would changing the name of J.C. Nichols be at the top of your list, the J.C. Nichols Fountain? It would be within the top five <laughs> uh, easily just because of the history. And when you go back and you look at it, there's never been a black-owned business in the plaza area. I think on Main Street you've had maybe two black-owned businesses there in history. So I, I believe that it is something that you could have a legitimate discussion about, but like he said, we've got some other racial issues going on. Uh, Cleaver Boulevard, for example, stops right at the plaza. Why didn't it go all the way through? Well, Could well, become 47th Street. You know, of course, this suggestion isn't <laughs> going to erase generations of, of racial history in this town. You know, there's just no reason to commemorate the life of, of, of someone like this and, and, and glorify it uh, with the city's most sensational fountain. This is not about erasing history, Nick. It's something about saying, hey, is this someone we should be honoring in this day and age? You know, this man uh, changed the course of this city for generations in terms of black-white relations. And, and as this country still continues to wrestle with these big issues, we need to be mindful of that. And all I'm simply saying is, take his name off the fountain, not a race history. Okay, has anybody taken up that charge? I know it's on Scott Parks' program, lots of people commenting on that. That took up a lot of energy. However, I mean, as somebody said, hey, let's do that. I, some letters to me suggested that they were <laughs> going to push for that. I haven't seen a member of the city council step forward yet, no. Okay, mm -hmm. Dave. I, I would only add this. I've seen a lot of people uh, talk about Steve's column and say, look, J.C. Uh, Nichols was a product of his time. That's the way it was back then. That seems like an extraordinarily poor thing to say. Racism 100 years ago isn't better than racism today. It's racism. And, and the fact that it happened in the 1920s or 30s doesn't excuse it at all. In fact, there were many Americans who were uh, in, ha had the courage to resist and reject racism even that long ago. The idea that we should forgive Thomas Jefferson because he owned slaves is wrong. He, he owned slaves. We, that should be part of his story. You can't just say, well, everyone owned them back then and say it's okay. And I think that's what's involved just in briefly some of this here, stuff. Nick, you know, while J.C. Nichols was segregating the city, Harry Truman was integrating the armed forces. Even though that thinking, the racist thinking was common back then, others stood up against it. In this star story online, uh, Clark writes, and says, well, rather than removing the name from the fountain, we should add a structure to the site that tells a more complete story of Nichols' accomplishments and his beliefs about Catholics, Jews, and blacks. Would that be more acceptable, Scott? Uh, it would be more acceptable than taking the name off the fountain, yes. But I, I think what we're doing here is, you know, with, with Steve's column here, is we're focusing on the, all the negatives of J.C. Nichols, and there are some. Clearly, there are some. But he, he, was, he was a visionary, too, when it came to, to the development of this city. Now, was he a racist? Yes. Is that forgivable? No. But he also created paths in Kansas City that I don't know that anybody else would have done or could have done. You know, that's true, but he developed this city, Scott, on the backs of African Americans. He divided this town, and he prevented generations of black people from being able to own homes and develop personal wealth and, and build up their own portfolios based on where they were forced to live. Right. That legacy lives on today, and it will for generations to come, and, and that's something we shouldn't be honoring today. But I'm, I'm not saying that we, dis, we ignore it or forget what J.C. Nichols really was, good and bad. But, but what I say on the radio when these kind of topics come up is where do you draw the line? I mean, Thomas Jefferson is on our money. George Washington is on our money. There are few other ways in this country that you can honor someone than by putting them on the very money that we used to buy things. But, but in this town, <laughs> at this time, we can start here. Then let's we, we Johnson change County. everything. Let's start here. This is the most dramatic example we have. Let's start and end here as we move on <laughs> on our weekend review, because we do have some other it's topics making discussion. the news. It is a good discussion. The Kansas Supreme Court months ago threatened to shut down schools at the end of June. That's next Friday, by the way. This week they announced that's not going to happen. The justices are averting a crisis in the classroom by allowing a new school funding law to go into effect while they decide whether it's constitutional. And the black-robed men and women on the bench won't even hear oral arguments now until the middle part of July. Does that mean that even if they say it is unconstitutional, 
unconstitutional. Lawmakers can wait until the next session in January to fix it, I, I think it's actually likely, you know, they've had a habit of sort of hearing these things in the summer and then issuing opinions in November or December, just before the legislature reconvenes. Uh, I, you know, the plaintiff, uh, uh, in, plaintiffs in this case have said they think the formula the legislature uh, worked out is inadequate. I'm not so sure that will be the case when the court hears this, this uh, n new appeal. Uh, I, I do think if you read between the lines of their opinions, they've sort of said, look, we're not going to give you a dollar figure, and we're going to give the legislature credit for a good faith effort, I think, uh, to try and solve this funding problem. And the idea that they would call a special session or bring people back after the mess that was the current session, I don't think is likely. We'll get something late in the winter, or late in the fall, early winter, and then the next year the legislature will take you know, it Dave up. makes great points, but I, I look at this a little bit differently. I think the numbers the legislature came up with were far short of the adequacy totals that the, the Supreme Court is talking about here. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised, Nick, if the judge, uh, judges look at this and then decide come fall, uh-uh, you're short, come on back and fix this before January with this current legislature. Now, speaking of Topeka, reports this week that federal officials are vetting Governor Sam Brownback for a post in the Trump administration. Which post? Still uncertain, but his name has been connected to two slots, ambassador for food and agriculture to the UN and ambassador at large for international religious freedom. Two of the governor's close associates confirmed to the Kansas City Star that they've been interviewed by federal officials about Brownback's character and qualifications, and they say an announcement could come soon. His exit would elevate Lieutenant Governor Jeff Collier, a Johnson County plastic surgeon, into the state's top office. According to reports, there's evidence that a transition is already taking place. What evidence is there of that? Well, I think there is some evidence that the governor's involvement in the ju session just adjourned has been limited, to say the least. He, he seemed extraordinarily, Nick, detached from that discussion. I think if you talk to most legislators, they considered him more or less a non-factor in their debate this year. They overrode his veto of the, of the uh, tax increase. They passed the budget on their own. Uh, I think the general assumption is he'll be gone by, certainly by the time school starts, Jeff Collier would then become the governor, and the 2018 election is then fully underway. You know, it's been fascinating to watch, Nick, because the lieutenant governor, uh, whose name is not very well known to Kansans, has been working steadily now for the past three or four months to raise his profile, to get better known, not only amongst lawmakers, but amongst the general public, <clears throat> giving more speeches around Topeka and around the state. There's clearly been an effort to raise his profile here. It may now be the official start of summer, but Missouri lawmakers have had to cancel their vacations. They're still mired in a second special session called by Governor Eric Greitens to tackle abortion-related issues. One of the main proposals would give the state attorney general power to prosecute violations of abortion laws. Under the measure, Attorney General Josh Hawley could step in whenever local prosecutors opted not to act. If there's a law that's being broken, um, if we, our health and safety regulations are not being enforced, um, we just want another set of eyes uh, looking on it because it's a very political issue and you may have uh, a lot of pressure on a local prosecuting attorney who may not want to take the case for political purposes. So isn't this a check on the system if laws are being broken? Shouldn't there be another avenue to pursue a prosecution? Scott? I would argue yes. Um, the, the abortion issue notwithstanding in this story, although I don't know how you ignore it, um, there is a supremacy clause in this country and it does entail, it doesn't allow for the state to oversee when this when the local districts or local attorneys don't do their job and the state thinks that there's a job that needs to be done that they can step in just like the federal government whether you like it or not uh, does take supremacy over the states in many issues dave it's a, amazing to presume that a local prosecutor would not take a case like this for political reasons but the state attorney general would have no political reasons whatsoever in his <laughs> or her own mind for taking this case. Uh, I'm a local control guy, Nick. I mean, I believe that local prosecutors, local city councils, local police chiefs can make their own decisions. And the idea that somehow uh, state attorneys general in, in any criminal matter would have the uh, a power to supersede local decisions seems to me a very slippery slope and one maybe we don't want to go down. You know, there's a very real fear here, Nick, that what this is going to do is politicize abortion even beyond <laughs> where it already is and turn the Missouri Attorney General, perhaps, if it's a Republican in many cases who's anti-abortion, into the same kind of Attorney General that mm -hmm. Phil Klein in Kansas was, which was a guy who rode on horseback all over the state, you know, decrying abortion 
abortion and fighting against it and filing motions and giving speeches, I'm not sure that's what we need in Missouri right now. And certainly Josh Hawley, the Missouri Attorney General, getting lots of national attention this week as he takes on the uh, pharmaceutical companies over the opioid crisis on all of the national networks as well. Y yes, and, and we think that's a really good idea. This crisis in Missouri is a burgeoning one, uh, not going away, and we applaud the Attorney General for taking the steps that he's taking. Speaking of the Missouri legislature, lawmakers pass a bill eliminating almost all funding for police sobriety checkpoints. Nearly $20 million is currently allocated to support local police departments in conducting the checkpoints aimed at catching drunk drivers. The sponsor of the measure claimed they were ineffective for the amount of money spent. The money is still available to local law enforcement, but only for alternative measures like an unannounced saturation patrols that put officers on the lookout for impaired drivers. A number of readers to the Star seem to agree. Dex writes, this is certainly great news concerning civil rights. Rather than illegally stopping 100% of traffic to get 0.03 of 1% of drunk drivers, they can concentrate on actual behaviors and rely on probable cause for stops. Does he have a point, Eric? He has a point, but if you were Tiger Woods, you probably would argue against uh, funding for that right now. But he's got a point there, but then public safety, you shouldn't put a price tag on public safety. Uh, you know, people are, are still driving intoxicated, they're under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So if you don't put the money out there, you don't create those checkpoints, and maybe it's the fear of being caught in those checkpoints is what's making people not drink and drive. Just checking on those numbers, he, he mentioned 0 0.03. Is that really correct? Well, on St. Patrick's Day, the Kansas City Police Department partnered with the Jackson County Sheriff's Office on a DUI checkpoint at 40th and Main. They stopped more than 1,100 vehicles, made 24 DUI arrests. That's actually 2.1% of all drivers. Are there more effective methods for doing this, Scott? I'm torn on sobriety checkpoints from the civil rights standpoint, but also because the numbers that you showed, and keep that keep in mind, and you pointed out that's 2.1%. That's on a day where Kansas Cityans do a lot of drinking. Think about, the, there's a sobriety checkpoint, we got notice of this uh, yesterday at the newsroom, there's gonna be one in Overland Park. They have to tell you that there's going, they don't tell you where, but just what city it's going to be in. And I would bet that number is going to be much lower than 2.1%. And yes, there may be more effective ways. Put, you know, how many police officers does it take to conduct a sobriety checkpoint? And you get seven arrests sometimes over with 700 vehicles stopped. Well, you can make the argument, well, that's an incredibly no, low number. Well, that, but you could also make the counter argument, well, what if one of those people would have collided with my family and killed kill them? Kill somebody. Yeah. Then it was a perfectly reasonable number to pull over that night. Yeah. Okay. And there's nothing in this bill that says um, local law enforcement, the Kansas City Police Department, the Lee Summit Police Department, can't go ahead and do these themselves. They're just not going to get the federal dollars that comes through the state to pay for it. I think that's right, Nick. And I think the fear of these sobriety checkpoints is so profound that I think it's had, we'll never know, of course, but a chilling effect on people who have been tempted to drink and drive for years in this town. And I would hate to see them go away altogether. Mr. Local Control, I mean, again, it doesn't stop the police departments from doing it themselves. They're just not going to get the state right, funding to right. make that happen. And, and I do believe that local police departments can make their own decisions about whether this is a, a good way to stop intoxicated drivers or not. Uh, you know, people say all the time, well, it doesn't catch enough uh, drunk drivers. You still have drunk drivers, uh, you know, have collisions and kill people. But just because something doesn't work every time doesn't mean it can't work at least some of the time. And, mm -hmm. and Scott's right. If, if your son or daughter is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, exposed to dying in a crash from a drunk driver, he, he, there's no cost that's too high to prevent that from happening. So, uh, I th you know, I'm a civil libertarian, and I agree that sort of blanket stops have some real problematic uh, aspects to them. But... Uh, if local departments decide that's the best way to approach this, I, I, I wouldn't question that. And I just did notice that 12 states do ban them already, and that includes states like Iowa and mm. Minnesota mm. and Michigan. It's been a big week in the world of sports in Kansas City as the Chiefs part ways with General Manager John Dorsey. And it's a week, we're told, to get ready for a major announcement from Major League Baseball concerning the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. At a news conference Wednesday, Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred joined with the head of the Players Union to donate a $1 million check to the museum at 18th and Vine. The donation matches a gift um, from Julia Irene Kaufman, which matches as the biggest in the history 
of the Kansas City attraction, founded in a one-room office nearly three decades ago. What does this mean for the museum, Eric? It means that they, that Bob Kendrick has done a tremendous job in marketing it, bringing people into it. I think one of the questions is, is how is this going to affect black kids in the area to play in RBI and play for uh, the Boys and Girls Club? Now they'll have an av avenue in which to have some recreation. So I think it's a great aspect for that museum. You know, Salvador Perez, gave, just as one Royals player, gave a million dollars for that new urban youth academy that's being built in that very same area, Scott. And it got me thinking about some people saying now, well, one million dollars, given the size of Major League Baseball, could that check have been more significant? <laughs> yes, sure it could have. But I will say... And at Actually, it was just half a million from the Players Association and Major League yeah. Baseball. Yeah, uh, I, I will say this just to follow up on, on something that Eric was saying. I, I had never been to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum until about three years ago mm -hmm. when Emmanuel Cleaver took me there and, mm -hmm. and gave me a private tour. That is one of the greatest hidden gems in this entire city. I, I, I mm -hmm. do not know how that has not become a major draw. Uh, not only for this city, but for this region and maybe even the country. It is one of the greatest hidden gems the city has to offer. I would just add that um, I'm not a big fan of jazz, but the Jazz Museum mm -hmm. is part of that complex too. You don't see the Jazz Museum getting million dollar checks from anyone, and I do think we need to pay attention to make sure that that facility has the kind of artifacts and, and, and entertainment and other things that maintain its half of that complex. The, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum has done a great job raising money. We want to make sure that both halves get cool. the support they need. And I agree with that. I, I, I do think, you know, a million dollars from Major League Baseball is a million bucks. I mean, you certainly want to appreciate that. But it comes with a couple of questions, and Scott's alluded to them. One is, what took him so long, <laughs> given the legacy of, of, of African-American ballplayers uh, in our country? And secondly, yeah. A million bucks was nice, but they could have been a little more generous. Keeping you up to date weekdays 10 to 11 on KCUR FM, Steve Kresge, and from the Cole newspaper, Eric Wesson. 50% of Dana and Parks, weekdays 2 to 6 on KMBZ Scott Parks, and from your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.